Hello everybody, this is Peter Swidler recording a highlights video for round 2 of Status Steel Chess Vikings A 2017. And for that video we've chosen uh, a game played by the reigning world champion uh, Magnus Carlsen with the white pieces against uh, Radoslav Wojtaszek, a very very strong uh, player and one of the premier theoreticians uh, of our age. Uh, um, Radek has uh, worked with uh, Vichy Anand for a number of years, but uh, he was a well-established well uh, theoretician uh, for for long before that, so uh, it was always going to be a very interesting, uh, a very interesting game to watch because uh, uh, of the clashing approaches to the opening. But perhaps on that one subject, we were, we were to be uh, somewhat disappointed because today was the day where Magnus came uh, very well prepared, it seemed, and actually knew more about the position they were playing uh, than his opponent. These things obviously happen. Magnus is. Uh, I think a lot better prepared than a lot of people give him credit for, but still uh, uh, to come out so much ahead, so far ahead against uh, against Stradek himself was uh, it was a notable uh, notable ch change I think to uh, what his games uh, normally looked like. And if you look at the score, Magnus before that game uh, was leading uh, in their personal encounters two one with no draws. And the two games uh, Magnus won against Radek were both uh, uh, games where he uh, completely avoided theoretical discussions in the opening. Uh, one was, I think, a close Sicilian, and the other one, uh, this weird mix of uh, the London system, uh, which eventually led to a position which you normally, I think, see from uh, the ETEX Z5 Karakan. But today, uh, Magnus played 1e4. His main move, of course, but uh, what was most surprising was his further uh, cho choices further down the road. C5, Knight of three, D6. Uh, his uh, very, very uh, clear main weapon in this position is Bishop B5 check. Magnus very rarely actually even plays 3D4 uh, compared to the amount of games he played and won uh, in the in the 3B5 check variation. But today he played D4 takes, Knight takes, Knight of six. Uh, in the match against Sergei Karakin in this position, he played uh, f3, but today he did not really need uh, a draw. Not that f3 is necessarily a drawing attempt, but it was played in a game where a draw was more than enough to secure the world title. Knight c3, a6, and uh, in this position, Magnus made a move which uh, <clears throat> was frankly... Uh, I still uh, did not check with the database because... Uh, uh, I like I like a bit a little bit of mystery in my life, but it does feel like this move perhaps was even introduced by Sergei Karakin one day ago uh, in the first round game against Tanish Giri. Sergei Karakin played six a three against the Nidorf, and we were very very surprised by that when commentating yesterday with uh, with Jan, and uh, I assume so was more, almost everybody else, and one day later Magnus was already prepared to repeat this. E5 was the reaction of Anish as well in his game against Karakin. There are other options available. If black plays e6, we assume the plan from white here is to switch to the Keras attack with the inclusion of a6 uh, and a3. Black probably isn't suffering horribly here, but uh, if you consider the fact that uh, uh, white normally plays h3, e6, and then g4, uh, if you replace, replace the move h3 and play a3, this, this will be quite useful in a lot of positions because uh, Black's very typical uh, counterplay in a lot of Sicilians is b5 followed by b4. And uh, I'm sure a3, now that both Karakin and Carlsen played it with white, will now become a very serious fixture in a lot of uh, tournaments. And eventually we will find out what uh, white is supposed to do against, let's say, 6g6. Or maybe uh, uh, knight c6 could also uh, be argued for. But uh, so far, the, the, both games feature e75, which is uh, the most logical reply. And uh, Karakin played knight of 3 here, aiming for uh, a long positional game, very similar to positions that you get after bishop e3, 5, knight of 3, for instance. Magnus, on the other hand, had very different ideas. He played knight of 5 here. And uh, the game becomes very, very forced. And uh, the next uh, two moves were blitzed out by both uh, players. d5, bishop g5, d4, 
Uh, if black takes uh, on f5, white even has an option uh, to start with bishop takes f6 and more or less force black to take with the g-pawn because uh, uh, queen takes f6, knight takes d5 is just absolutely horrible and white should be uh, very seriously better here. Another advantage of having the pawn on a3 in these types of positions is that bishop b4, which would have been a very strong move here, is just impossible because we uh, white now controls the b4 square. Um, g4 was uh, played quite fast by, by Radek and uh, Magnus took on f6 here. And here uh, uh, Radek started thinking, which was a little bit surprising because uh, uh, I felt that if you blitz out both d5 and d4, you probably should have some idea as, as to what's going on in this particular position. And starting uh, to think uh, precisely here is a bit inconsistent. And uh, on the other hand, you have to say that this is a, a very critical turning point. Uh, Radek eventually opted for queen takes f6, which is a safer option, I suppose, but it does allow white uh, uh, to get a reasonably uh, serious Greek on, grip on the position and as we will see in the game a very logical continuation from here leads to a position where white enjoys a stable plus with almost no counterplay for black which I think is something you generally don't want to get uh, in your games against Magnus Carlsen. The other option was g takes f6 and in this position we briefly discussed uh, knight e2 queen b6 on stream and uh, uh, at low depth, uh, the computer even suggested black is better here. It's uh, it's not that clear if this is true or not, uh, but uh, black definitely gets a very playable position. This much this much you, you can say safely, and the machine even suggests that because of this, knight a2 is a stronger option than knight e2. This is quite difficult to understand. Apart from maybe making an argument uh, that if black plays queen b6 you can immediately start developing your light square bishop to, to good squares, which I think is important. Uh, and this position is uh, not that clear. Uh, it remains to be seen whether Magnus was planning to play knight e2 or knight a2, but gf6 is definitely a very, very serious move that uh, deserved attention. Uh, what was strange is that uh, that attention has not been paid uh, uh, to this position by by Radek before the game, because uh, as mentioned, d5 and d4 were played instantly, uh, which suggested that uh, the game between Karekin and Giri attracted his attention enough to actually analyze the line for a little bit. But uh, back to the actual uh, the actual game. Queen takes, knight d5, queen d8, and here a very smart move, queen g4, which looks impossible because uh, seemingly black can just uh, win a piece by playing g6. But here, white goes queen g3, knight c6, and knight takes d4. And once again, uh, I can't claim that I checked this very deeply, but it does seem that the uh, the ensuing uh, ensuing uh, complications favor white, and uh, he just stabilizes and ends up uh, with extra material because e takes d4 is, uh, of course, uh, running into knight c7 check and knight takes a8, and it seems like this knight is not going to get captured. Uh, because of that, bishop takes f5 is, uh, well, the only other really sensible option, queen f5, uh, bishop d6, and here Magnus uh, thought for a very, very long time, uh, considering that he was more or less blitzing up to, up to that point, and went with h4. You can also, of course, immediately develop uh, the bishop to c4, but I think uh, Magnus was very attracted to the idea of, uh, of the rook lift, uh, activating this this rook via h3 towards perhaps the g3 square because black is very very likely to castle kingside here and he felt that the king on e1 will be safe enough and can uh, if need be uh, just it can just be walked towards the g1 square later in the game and it's more important to immediately activate the rook uh, than it is to uh, castle as fast as possible knight c6 bishop c4 b5 Bishop b3. We were somewhat arguing for bishop a2 instead of bishop b3, but it probably doesn't really make a great deal of uh, difference here. Knight e and here um, it was possible for white to take on e7 first and play rook h3 here, which we uh, even argued a little bit for uh, in the broadcast. But um, what Magnus did is also perfectly fine and 
I think uh, his understanding of what's uh, going on in the position was uh, further confirmed by uh, uh, computer analysis because uh, the one criticism uh, we sort of had uh, for his move queen g4, which he chose over, over the capture on e7, castles and rook h3, was that the computer originally suggests that in this position queen c8 is just very strong, forcing white to uh, either trade queens, which is something that he doesn't really want to do yet because uh, his play is mainly connected with the uh, potential attack against the black king because the bishop on d5 is a lot better than the bishop on d6. Uh, or go queen e2, or allow something like queen g5, queen takes c2, which at the first glance looks like a very, very strong uh, exchange sacrifice, giving black a lot of counterplay. But if you continue analyzing this position, it turns out that after a precise series of moves, rook c1, queen takes b2, and here we fail to, sp to spot the uh, the most precise continuation. I think during the, the broadcast we were trying to make h h5 work and it doesn't really give mate immediately. But it does actually win for white if you include rook b3, queen a2 and uh, only, only play h5 here. Rook c8 is the only tribal that can even uh, attempt here. And now takes, takes, queen c1, hg6 and simply rook h3 is just completely winning for white. Uh, Therefore, black needs to be very, very careful. And this line kind of demonstrates how quickly uh, the attack will progress on the king side if black is not careful. Radic played rook a7, rook g3, queen f6, which is very, very natural. And it's not that easy to, to shift this kind of a uh, defensive setup from black. Because if you play rook f3, which looks kind of logical, after queen g6, your pieces start getting pushed back. and. Uh, Black's position doesn't really feature a lot in the way of weaknesses. Yes, the bishop on d6 is passive and the bishop on d5 is a monster, but you still need to find targets to play against. And this is why Magnus <coughs> started opening up, <coughs> sorry, started opening up the second front here with a3, a4. <coughs> and uh, objectively, perhaps this position is still very much <coughs> holdable for black. I apologize, I seem to be losing my voice, so... Uh, I might sound funny for the rest of this video. Um, and uh, the suggestion uh, is perhaps to even just close the, the, the queen side completely and play b4. But from a human perspective, just uh, going for a position like this, let's say, uh, long castles, rook c7, king b1 and a5, and saying, I will never have any counterplay, but neither will you at any point make any progress on the king side. because. Uh, with this structure on the queen side looking like this, white can uh, always play bishop b3, eliminating the only source of counterplay that black has, which is the uh, you know play against the c2 pawn, and then start improving on the king side. And perhaps you can hold this, but honestly, I sort of doubt it because generally in positions like this, the side which has the initiative will eventually find a way to either make a lot of progress on the king side, <clears throat> or perhaps combine his attack on the king side. Uh, with play eventually against the a5 pawn even. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, you almost never go for this because you feel that uh, giving white a completely free hand at looking for a plan to, to invade is uh, not a good idea. Because of that, Radic played bishop b4, king f1, takes, takes, and a5. Sorry for the slight pause, I decided to <clears throat> try a drink of water to perhaps stop sounding like a, like a, a, a broken we weaving thing instead of a normal human being. And uh, by doing that, uh, black preserves some counterplay against the c2 pawn in particular because there will also always be the idea of a5, a4 to challenge the bishop on b3 even when it lands there. But it also creates some weaknesses white could potentially later play against, and we will see both of those themes later in the game. The rook does nothing on a4 at all, so Magnus uh, uh, brings it back. Rook a1, rook c7, bishop goes to b3. And uh, once again, here, uh, the machine, at least initially, I will, you know, the depth is not really uh, big enough to, to have any kind of definitive judgment, but 
it does suggest that nothing really horrible <clears throat> is happening to black here. And if he goes king h8 followed by uh, some maneuvers in his camp, there's really not a lot white can do about it. But you get the feeling that perhaps if you leave it running for a while, it might change its mind. And uh, rook a8 is an understandable move that uh, Radek chose here, uh, trying to even stop white from, for instance, attempting something like rook d1, uh, d3, f3, because a5, a4 will uh, be a very, very serious argument against it. Uh, Magnus continued securing his king position, uh, black played bishop f8. All of these moves are, perhaps you can argue, not entirely necessary, but you can also understand why uh, Radek is making them. He is... Uh, making his position as compact as possible, trying to keep as many things as possible under control. Queen h5, uh, trying to provoke black uh, to, uh, to at least make the move g6, which creates uh, some targets to play against on the king side, and also takes the g6 square away from the queen. And once again, you can maybe make an argument for playing something like rook a7 and just completely not obliging white in all of these, in all of his attempts to provoke some weaknesses. But Radek, who was also running somewhat short on time, played g6, queen g4, and rook a6. Rook a6 is a bit of an artificial move, and uh, here also the uh, the suggestion to activate your bishop and put, place it on h6 perhaps deserves attention, uh, aiming for bishop h6 and then king g7, which is a somewhat stable setup, and the fact that the bishop will have some moves later in the game might, might definitely come in handy. Uh, rook a6, h5, queen f4, queen e2, queen f6. And uh, this sequence kind of shows that black perhaps lost lost the thread, uh, the thread a little bit. And uh, um, he is doing nothing and allowing white to try all kinds of improving, uh, improving ideas here. And his position is definitely uh, deteriorating because of that. White uh, made some progress and the queen now uh, starts attacking things on the other flank and... Uh, this is where Radek, I think, committed his uh, de de the mistake that decided the game, but he did not really have a lot of time here, and uh, he thought he has a tactical solution which will drive the queen back towards d3 or e2, and that proved to be incorrect, and uh, it was very difficult to come back from that. He could have played rook c5, and perhaps after that move uh, the, the queen would have to return, because... Uh, uh, white really doesn't achieve very much by playing queen b7 or queen b8 because black has uh, black can even maybe chase that queen around forever by playing rook b6 and, and so on. Uh, but uh, Radek spotted a tactical opportunity to offer the exchange of queens by playing queen c6. And uh, after queen takes c5, uh, only here did he spot that the intended bishop d6, and we have to assume that this is what he was planning to do, uh, and I, I guess he thought he's winning the exchange here, but uh, as a matter of fact, h takes g6, h takes g6 is just an immediate uh, end of game, because uh, if you take the queen, you just get mated on the spot. And if bishop d6 is not a move, what happened is black uh, gave up a central pawn for not a lot, and uh, from that moment on, Magnus' victory was all, by, well, all, all but secured, because... Uh, e5 was a, obviously a very, very important pawn, and it's very difficult to defend the position, which was quite unpleasant, even with the pawn on the board, when this pawn is gone for nothing. Rook e7, queen f4 is a good move. Queen takes d4 would have been a, a lot less precise. If you take on d4 and black takes with the queen on e4, his life is uh, a lot easier compared to uh, what they got in the game, because uh, it's very useful for black to uh, remove those central pawns and uh, activate his queen. The queen might land on e5 later. There's also a5, a4 if white doesn't trade the queen. So this is, of course, still much better for white, but queen f4, the much stronger. If black takes, uh, a4 is what uh, Radek played, but if black takes on e4 here, bishop takes f7, uh, king, uh, rook f7, queen takes f4 is, of course, completely, uh, completely impossible. But even after king g7, and the simple takes, takes, hg, hg, and bishop c4. This has to be a technically winning position for white. Uh, with all the weaknesses that you can play against, uh, I think it will be impossible to hold. And after a4, uh, bishop d5, um, you would dearly like to take on, a f uh, on c2 here to at least, uh, uh, for the time being, uh, bring the material back to, back to even, but... Uh, 
rook c1, uh, queen b2, rook c8 is quite strong here. You could also try hg, uh, hg, rook f3, which uh, also leads to positions which are much, much better for white. So both of those options uh, look quite promising. Uh, and uh, being very, very short on time, you can understand Radek's decision not to uh, involve himself in, in, in variations which could lead to uh, immediate losses. But after queen c7, queen d2, there's really very, very little hope left for black because the, you get the feeling that white will eventually completely stabilize, uh, improve his pieces a, a little bit further, and then will start either the uh, decisive attack against the black king or will collect something uh, on the other flank because both a4 and d4 are definitely potential targets. And this is what happened in the game. Queen b6, rook a2, rook c7, rook f3, queen b4. White, of course, does not want to trade queens here. Queen e2, rook b6, takes, takes, g3, king g7, king g2. And with this, Magnus made the time control. I think it, he made a very, very decent practical decision to uh, not even try to win the game before the time control because there's really no need. Uh, he is uh, so much in control here that he can just slowly improve the, the position of his pieces and uh, calculate something uh, on move 41. But Radek still needed to make a move 40 here. And it's actually not that easy to find a move to make because now that white is uh, totally stable, even perhaps c2, c3 is a threat because the rook on c7 is so overloaded. And the move Radek eventually made, rook d7, uh, is uh, quite bad because uh, you take uh, the pressure off the pawn on uh, c2 and also the rook really doesn't belong on d7, it will be hanging in a lot of variations. And now white has a number of, uh, number of options which are very, very strong. Rook f4 connected with the idea of queen f3 was probably very strong, but also the move that Magnus made is uh, probably decisive, creating threats of c3 and picking up the pawn on a4. And black is now so discoordinated that it's very, very difficult even to keep the material, uh, to, to keep, uh, to prevent losing more material is what I'm trying to say. Uh, Perhaps you, you can uh, put up a stronger defense that, uh, than, than Radek did, but the position has to be objectively lost. Black played rook f6, takes, takes. And here, after queen g4, it really is completely resignable for black because he gets mated in most variations. And uh, the machine starts suggesting you, you have to give up your, your entire structure here in order not to get mated. But the move c3, which Magnus chose, is also totally winning, as evidenced by the fact that after d takes c3 and rook takes a4, uh, Radek thought for a while and just resigned because he has a choice of either losing the, uh, uh, the c pawn as well or taking on b2 uh, and getting mated either after you know, the prosaic king e7, queen e5, and rook e8, or uh, the more beautiful king g5, and now white plays queen h8, and there's really no, no good defense against uh, queen h4 mate. The only move that kind of stops that is bishop h6. But then after queen e5, f5 and simply ef, white gives. Apparently this is mate in 5, but even if you don't know this is mate in 5, there can be no doubt uh, that uh, white will win in the immediate future. So a very smooth victory for uh, the world champion. And also an interesting continuation of this newfangled, newfangled trend uh, of playing uh, 6a3 against the Nidorf. Uh, with that victory, Magnus is on uh, one and a half out of two, and he is in shared second place with uh, uh, Pintala Hare Krishna, who beat uh, his uh, compatriot uh, after Adiban, somewhat inexplicably uh, uh, sort of self-mated himself in the run-up to the 40th move. Uh, in a position which, uh, of course, was uh, not that easy to play, but really did not require such such uh, drastic measures as allowing mate mate in four with checks. And the outright leader of the tournament is Pavel Elyanov, who followed uh, his victory uh, yesterday over Richard Rapport with a win with black against Luke Van Veli, who played a reasonably solid game. Uh, we thought during the live broadcast that he was even uh, somewhat better somewhere around move 25. Uh, and then uh, his advantage was gone, but he was still perfectly fine until he allowed some uh, fatal activ uh, activation of the black pieces and, and lost instead of 
uh, making a, a very solid draw. So Pavel is on, on 100% with 2 out of 2. Uh, Carlsen and Hare Krishna are on a point and a half out of two and the rest of the field is trailing further behind but this is obviously a very very long tournament so there will be uh, still uh, a lot of chopping and changing uh, in the score table and with that I'll, I'll wrap up my highlights video of round two uh, see you tomorrow for round three of Tata Steel Vikings A 2017 this has been Peter Swidler for Chess24